Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Terry, and I'm a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon and Alateen. Hey, everybody. Um, my home group is the Seminole al Family Group. We meet on Tuesdays at noon at this little church in Altamont Springs. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that a little bit later. I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor. I sponsor. Those women sponsor. Um, that's how we do it in our family. Um, and I'm held accountable. So, I want to first start with thanking Lee for asking me to come and speak here. Um, Lee and I are connected through the great state of Arkansas. And thank you, Lee. Thank you, Anne, and the committee as well. Um, I appreciate that. Joy and Jane, thank you so much for sharing yourselves with us. Um, I appreciate it. Your walking miracles of this program um, of AA, which Alan is very grateful for, and I am for the, the steps because those steps have actually saved my life, too. And um, I once was told um, by a therapist that I was seeing that it was um, she was surprised I wasn't a prostitute or a drug addict. And um, I said, oh, okay, well, I could aspire to that, but I was trying to do things a little bit different. So um, this morning, I'm a very disciplined person. I wasn't when I came to Al-Anon, which would have been in July of um, 1989. Um, Thank you for that. There you go. Um, But I became disciplined very quickly um, by the love and guidance of a sponsor who um, has required me to do my readings, prayers, and meditations every morning, of which I did those this morning. Um, In our sponsorship family, we carry a sentence or two with us throughout the day. This morning, mine is from today's Courage to Change reading, and it was very appropriate for me um, today, since I'm sharing my story with you, because it said, my view of a situation is only the truth as seen from my tiny corner of the universe. So I'm getting ready to to share with you my truth, Terry's truth. It might not match the truth of the other people that were um, in my family system, but it is what happened to me, and uh, I'm honored to be here today to be able to share that with you. Uh, So I grew up in St. Charles, Missouri, a very blue-collar kind of town. Um, My parents had to get married. They um, were both students at Lindenwood College. My dad was fresh out of the Navy. My mother was um, had grown up in Kansas City in Lee Summit. And uh, she was at Lindenwood College, and my dad was a Catholic. So I was raised Catholic, and um, it's been fun to hear um, our other two speakers talk about that. And so since my father was Catholic and my mother was pregnant, you know what had to happen. They had to get married. So... Um, Indeed, they did. And what I can tell you is that I did not have a Leave It to Beaver childhood. It was everything but that. Um, From the minute I can remember, my mother told me that she wished I'd never been born and that I had ruined her life. Those were two messages that I heard repeatedly um, while I was growing up. And um, when you're a child and you are in that type of situation, you believe that. At least for me, I believed it. I was being told I was the problem. Therefore, I must be the problem, right? Um, so my parents, my dad was, uh, he worked for IBM. He was an IBM lifer. My parents ended up getting a divorce when I was in the fifth grade. I remember this as it was, as it happened last night. The, the memories are so vivid for me. There was fighting going on in my home, and I heard it at night like every kid does, right? You hear your parents arguing, and um, my parents had decided they were going to get a divorce. But I have a sister. She's four and a half years younger than me. So um, what's that put her in first grade? So we were um, brought into the living room, and we sat down on the couch, and my mother announced that she and my father were getting divorced, and she asked me who we would like to live with. Now, putting that type of responsibility on a fifth grader, not exactly fair. Um, 
But that is the disease of alcoholism that was going on in our house. That is what was happening. Now, I will share with you that I was dreadfully frightened of my mother all my life. Um, I was very, very frightened. So last night listening to your story was so awesome because your sons are growing up with a voice, right? You're in recovery, and they have that voice. And um, I was not allowed to have a voice. Because everything that I said was discounted, right? And um, I was told it's not that way. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, after my parents got a divorce, my mom started dating this guy who was in the Air Force, handsome Air Force guy, uniform, the whole thing. And I, it was, you know, we lived in the St. Louis area. It snows there. So it was, uh, woke up in the morning, tons of snow everywhere. Everybody snowed in. And with this beautiful big picture window, I looked outside, and his car was still across the street, parked on the road. So my mom got up, and I said, hey, is Rod here? And she said, Rod's not here. And I said, well, his car's right across the street. Rod is not here. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, that poor guy climbed out of a bedroom window two stories down to get to his car in the snow, right? And so we had this thing where, in my life, I began to fabricate the stories so people wouldn't know what was really going on, right? The denial with which I was living. Um, I tried real hard in high school to fit in. I was a cheerleader. I was a member of the student body council, president of my class, but I never felt like I fit in anywhere. I was trying hard, so hard, desperately to fit in, and I just didn't. From the outside, you would have thought, she fits in. Inside, I was dying because I would come home to a person who um, who did the best, today I know, did the absolute best that they could with what they had. Um, I would come home and be, I had to cook. From the time I was 11, I began to be the parent. And my sister and I have, um, we struggled with this for a long time. It's hard to imagine an 11-year-old as a parent, but unfortunately my sister viewed me as the parent. 11-year-olds don't do a great job parenting, I can assure you. They don't. Um, they know how to make beanie weenies, grilled cheese sandwiches, um, Campbell's tomato soup. Um, I can do, I can't eat those. Well, I can eat a grilled cheese today. The other stuff, not so much. But, um, you know, they walk to store, to the grocery store to get the groceries, right? I, Swanson TV dinners, that was a staple. That's what I, I figured it out, right, as I went along on what to do. So I was doing those things, but I also had to take care of my mom when I got home. And so our freezer, um, was, uh, I, you know, this lovely brown freezer, and the freezer had two round, perfectly round, um, sections for a gallon bottle of vodka, two gallons of vodka fit in there very nicely, very chilled. And that was all that was in our freezer was that. And, uh, so, you know, we learned how to make cocktails from an early age and, um, that's just how it was, right? That's how it was. Um, I was humiliated many times when, um, at a basketball game, I would be cheering and my mom would be there and she had had too much to drink and would be asked to leave. Um, the basketball stadium, right? So I tried uh, a, I tried to become an alcoholic. I'll be really honest with you. I did. Um, there was one summer that I, I tried to drink a lot. I was cracking up to myself last night because when uh, we were sharing about that place between the fourth and fifth drink, I, I don't even get to the <laughs> second drink. I mean, you know, I'm like thinking a glass of wine and I'm doing good. You know what I mean? So I'm just like, I can't even imagine that. So that's the difference, right? Whew. So, but one summer I tried really hard. I tried and tried. I thought, you know, if I'm going to, I'm going to try to fit in because by this time my sister had begun to um, drink and do some things as well. And so I didn't fit in at home either. Right. That's kind of how I was feeling. I didn't fit in. So, um, it was uh, a time for me that a lot of really bad things happened. I've got years in my life that um, are browned out. You know, we call them brownouts in Alabama, not blackouts, but they're brownouts. And um, when I remember doing my fourth and fifth step and sharing with my sponsor, oh, I feel so bad because I can't remember this. And she'd say, you know, when you need to know, you'll know. And you may never need to know, but you just need to give that to God. And, you know, when you find out about it or remember, then we'll talk about it and we'll deal with it. Um, and recently, I've gotten the opportunity to look at some family pictures, and, um, you know, there are times, I just don't remember some years, and there were some things that were going on that were, were not good, so 
as Lee has shared with me, this is a safe place. I love women's conferences. I go to one every year back in Arkansas, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. But um, what was happening in my home, my mother had a series of men who would be in our home. And unfortunately for me, I became a victim in that. Um, and not only that, then I'd ha- try to get a boyfriend, right? Because everybody wants a boyfriend. Everybody wants a Lee, you know. Um, that's going to be our theme of the weekend, I think. So um, I'd start dating and end up, my mother would end up sleeping with the boys that I was dating. So these are the kinds of things that were going on. And so for me, it was, uh, gosh, I didn't have a very good example. You know what I mean? Just a, not a very good example. Um, and kind of came... You know, where I've come to through these years, through my recovery, um, has been one of a miracle. And I will share that with you. But, you know, the journey has been painful and sad. But I tell you, it's had a lot of breathtaking happiness along the way. So how did I find my way to al Well, I was struggling. You know, I tried to go to college. And, I, you know, I didn't have a good... My dad had given up and moved to North Carolina. Back in the 70s, what could you do? No, nobody looked at women had a drinking problem. They weren't, he wasn't going to be able to get the children, um, so he left, right? The Catholic Church and I had a problem for a number of years, and I had to kind of work my way through that because my mother would tell me that the Catholic Church didn't accept me because now that they were divorced, I was a bastard child. So these are the things, right, that you that I had to reconcile to um, eventually uh, to to work my way through that. So anyway, it was you know a lot of good stuff was happening as well. I was looking for a solution, right? Looking for something. My the hole in my soul was big, um, just like it was in all of yours, and I needed something for that. And I was looking in all the wrong places, like everybody else. Um, doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. Um, ended up g- getting married to a guy who's the whole, you know, the holes in his his head fit the holes in my head and all that jazz. And um, uh, I ended up working. He put him through college. All these things that you hear of. I'm a caretaker, right? That's what I do. Um, I'm I'm going to do whatever I can in order so you will be all right because that's how I was kind of wired to make sure that you would be okay. I was always constantly worried about you. When I got to Al-Anon, I didn't know what my favorite food was, what my favorite color was, what my favorite movie. I didn't know any of that. I had no clue who Terry was. I knew everything about my husband. I could tell you his favorite place to vacation, his favorite color, his favorite food, his, all those things. Um, that marriage did not last. Um, surprise, surprise, and here's how that happened. Um, I, I came to Al-Anon, and here's, here's what brought me to my desperation. My desperation is that I, ha- um, I have an old, my oldest daughter. She's 23. I had her worth with my first husband. We were living in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, which is in the boot hill of Missouri. My, um, my mom is up in St. Charles. At, she and my sister are active doing what they're doing. And I have this precious, precious little baby. So they drive down to see this precious, precious baby. And I just thought I was going to die. I, Thought, I literally thought if someone had a gun, I would just end my life because for me at that time, my mom's breathing on this baby, the alcoholic breath, the way that she smelled, for me, it was disgusting. And I didn't want, I, it was like all this instinct, the mother hen instinct, right, to protect this baby because I didn't want anything to happen to this baby. Um. That is what I think brought me to my desperation because I knew that there had to be a different way. What I was so fearful of was, um, and and guns comes into play. When I was in college, I came home one weekend. I did try to go to college, the University of Missouri, which is about halfway between Kansas City and St. Louis. And uh, I tried to go to school there. Didn't wasn't great about attending classes, but um, I did did go there. And I came home one weekend and I looked. Perfect. You would have thought, right? I was trying so hard. I had little, my little yellow knee-high socks, my plaid blue shorts, my white button-down shirt. I had long hair, big yellow bow in my head. Cute. Little sorority girl, right? And I walked into my house, and my mother had a gun on my sister. My sister was be- begging my mother to kill her. Now, I turned around and walked away. I don't know how I got back to the University of Missouri that weekend. I don't know, but I did. 
But that was just an incident, right? That was just one of many. And uh, so I had this weird problem with guns for years. And uh, I was worried that my mom was going to, I mean, obsessed. When we talk about obsession, and Alan, my sponsor, always goes like this. You know, it's the octopus on my face. Because it was an obsession, I knew, I knew, right, how sometimes we're so smart, we know. I knew she was going to come down to Papa Bluff and kill my daughter and I, so I had to do something. There was crazy thinking, absolutely insane thinking on my half. But I got some help. And um, this, this therapist led me to Alana. Now, when all this was going on, my husband, we moved from Poplar Bluff to Little Rock, Arkansas. And thank you, God, I got to Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, we were, we were there, and I found my way. I was in a job, and I'm working, and I had the, how these things happen, I don't know. I had lunch with a gal, and we started talking, and she starts talking about her parents, and they were both alcoholic, and she had just started going to Alana, and I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, wow, well, my mother has a drinking problem, and she's like, why don't you go to a meeting with me? And I said, okay. So I met her, you know, at the Protho Junction exit, and um, I went to this meeting, and I got there, and they were all laughing. You know, you've heard the stories. They're all laughing and hugging and rubbing each other's backs, and I thought, oh, shit. What the heck? You know, I didn't know what to do, so I sat in the back. It's a pretty big room, and there's a, there's a ring of seats around. There's like a big, you know, table and a ring of seats. And I sat in the back, right, and listened and was in shock, right, in shock because they were cracking up about things that I was not cracking up about, you know. Oh, yeah, and this is what happened. Uh, I'm like, right. So, um, but something happened within me that night, um, that I kept coming back and I kept suiting up and showing up um, almost on autopilot because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to go. Um, at that time, my husband was having an affair with a college graduate in the same apartment complex we was. That didn't work out too well for me. Um, so uh, he did not like the fact that I was going to al did everything that he could to get me to stop, right? He'd say, I'm not going to watch um, our child at the time. He's not going to watch her. He had to go to work. He had to do this. I got a sponsor. You know, I kept hearing that. It's big in my um, home group back in Arkansas that you get a sponsor. So I did. And my sponsor started making me take care of myself, right? So she said, get a babysitter. Okay, well, isn't that a little weird that I get a babysitter when he's sitting right there at home? She said, I don't care. Get a babysitter. So I did. And um, he didn't like it because I was changing, right? I was changing. And um, for years I was, um, you, early on in my recovery and how and on, I'd be in uh, meetings. I w- went to a lot of open AA speaker meetings. It was an assignment for my sponsor because when I got to Alan, I can assure you that I hated my mother, despised, right? And uh, my sponsor lovingly and kindly told me, you know, you're going to go to open AA meetings. You're going to hear about the disease of alcoholism. And so I-, I did. I went to a ton of meetings, and they were they were hopeful for me, right? Hopeful. Got a lot of hope in that. Um. But anyway, so uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but not important, I guess. Um, so my my sweet little sponsor um, started giving me assignments, right? So you guys have had assignments too, but I got assignments that I didn't like. Like I had to start buying my mother cards, right, for birthdays and Christmas and this kind of thing. And it's really hard. I could work for Hallmark and write cards that aren't emotional. That's the kind of, I was just looking for that card that would say, Happy Mother's Day. Um, You know, I'd read them and I would be paralyzed at the Hallmark store because I'm crying thinking, who are these mothers that people are writing about because it's not mine, right? Um, And I would be angry, angry about that. But, you know, my sponsor told me I needed to continue to take the actions, continue to take the actions. And I'd, I'd listen to women um, and Alan on talk from the podium, and they'd talk, oh, yes, and I got in recovery, and then my mother got an AA, and we're, we're just best friends, and we go shopping every Tuesday, and we go on vacation together. And I thought, oh, my God, I'd love that. I, guys, I never had that. That's not a reality for me, and it will never be a reality for me, and I'll, I'll share with you a little bit later why. Um, so... You know, the fact that I was changing, my husband didn't dig it, um, but but I knew to to save my life, I needed to do something different. That is where I had gotten to. 
And I would tell you that I believe that having my daughter, um, God gave me the gift of that child to save my life. Um, had I not had her and be able to put her above myself for a limited period of time until I was taught to put myself first, I probably would not have made it. Um, that child has, as she's gotten older, has afforded me the opportunity to deal with all the things that happened to me every time she got to those ages, right? So she would get to a certain age, and I'd start to wig out, right? And I'd say, oh, why am I wigging out? And um, i talked to my sponsor, and we'd figure it out, right? It was because whatever had been happening to me when she is 13, right, when I was 13 and she was 13, that is why I started to identify with her ages as she was growing up. So um, luckily for me, I didn't run from that and didn't hide from that pain that had happened. Um, I got help, right? Um, I talked to my sponsor. I was uh, honest about it. I... Um, and got, got outside help, and thank you for that, right? Thank you for the, the program giving us permission to get outside help, right? Um, because through that, my darkest past, right, the darkest things that have happened to me, that awful, awful things that happened, have been able to help other people because um, I've had the ability to heal and um, not just be a survivor, be a thriver, you know? I'm thriving. Um, I was able to get remarried and have, you know, what I think is a pretty healthy marriage today. I have two other fabulous children. None of these kids really knew me in my nutty stage. Um, they never have grown up in an active household. They, um, my uh, two younger kids are 16 and 13. They're, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go speak at this conference this weekend. All right, Mom, have have fun. You know, um, my kids have the ability to talk today. They have a voice. Right. They they my my son. I love when you're sharing about your son last night because my son is he'll say, Ma, why are you wearing that? I, you know, just not even coordinate, you know, and my, my daughter will be like, you know, I'm mad at you. Right. Mom, I'm really upset. You hurt my feelings. My kids have learned how to do that because I learned how to do that. I learned how to communicate. Therefore, they learned how to communicate um, because of the example that I am giving them. I was not allowed to communicate in my house at all. I'll give you one example is, you know, I was uh, a junior in high school looking for love in all the wrong places. I thought I was pregnant. Um, I was not, but thought I was. And uh, that night, again, very clear memory for me, I um, told my mother, you know what, I think that I'm pregnant. And the response that I got was silence. She picked up the phone, she called her boyfriend, and she stood outside our home and smoked a cigarette until he came to pick her up. The abandonment, right? So the abandonment of not having anyone to, to talk with about that. And looking back, I know that I was just, I was reaching out, right? Reaching out for help in any way. Bad behavior, good behavior, didn't matter. I tried it all. Tried to be good, tried to be bad, tried to make straight A's, tried to flunk, all that searching. Luckily, I have a higher power today. Um, that has has been that um, parent for me, plus all the women in my life, right? Um, my granny sponsor told me that I could find mothers everywhere, and I have. I have many mothers. My granny sponsor taught me how to make the best pie you can ever have. I learned how to cook um, from her. I've learned how to do a lot of different things from a lot of different women and sought out the examples right thought, sought out good examples of people uh, of what to do so um you know this is the the life that i had and the recovery that i've had has been ongoing so a little bit here i am in recovery and remarried got these two little kids our oldest daughter was 12 at the time here i am i'm tr i'm doing all these things my sponsor's telling me to do sending the cards, you know, doing those things, calling my mom once a week, um, all those things. And it was, um, uh, our oldest daughter was 12, so she's 23 now, 11 years ago, is that right? So we're on our way from Poplar Bluff, or from Arkansas to St. Louis for a soccer game. She was in a traveling soccer tournament team thing. We're going up there. you got to love St. Louis because they have, like, Budweiser trucks at the soccer game at 8 a.m. Crazy. Um, so... 
my mom lives up there. So we call, I call her because we were going to plan to have dinner with her the night that we got there. Um, and I called her in the answering machine. Her answering machine goes, Terry, this is mother. Um, I don't want to see you this weekend. I mean, that was on her answering machine for anybody who called. All right. How humiliated was I? Um, and I was just, you know, one more time devastated. And at one point, my sponsor and I decided that I could stop trying. I could, she gave me permission to stop trying. And I did. And, uh, I didn't talk to my mom for over seven years. Over seven years, there was no communication. Now, I still sent cards. I did not call. I sent cards, and I said pictures of the children, right, little notes, annual letters, whatever. Did that. Um, but but here's what has happened. Uh, October of 2009, um, I got to tell you, though, I moved from Arkansas to Florida. I missed that somehow. Four and a half years ago, my company relocated us here. Um, I took over a pretty large division for my company. I'm a senior vice president of a Fortune 500 company here in Orlando, Florida. And uh, yay, woo, woohoo. Um, Florida is not the South. It's not like Arkansas. I thought it was going to be a snap. It's been one of the hardest things I've ever done. Okay. It was very hard for me. My family loved it when we moved here. My husband grew up in New York City. He, Arkan, Little Rock, Arkansas was always a little small for him. And um, he loves it here. He loves professional basketball. So we have Magic tickets. Um, our two younger, yay, go Magic. Uh, hope they can get that whole deal worked out so we have a season. Um, our two younger kids love it here. They're very happy here. I struggled for 18 months. After we moved. Now, I was working 24 hours a day. I was traveling, visiting customers. I thought I could integrate well, right? I'll find a group. I'll do this. I'll do that. It's hard to rebuild your life when you're moving, right? It is hard. Um, so uh, anyway, so here we are. So I don't even know where. Boom, ba-doom, ba-doom. Okay, so I'm on this business trip in Kansas City. I've got a division in Lenexa, Kansas. So I'm up in Kansas City and um, doing the thing. Had this big dinner. And um, I got back to my hotel room, and I noticed that I had some missed calls on my cell phone that were all 314 area codes. Well, 314 is the St. Charles area, St. Charles, Missouri area. So I'm like, well, this is weird. So I listened to my voice notes. Now, it's about 1130 at night. Um, you know, I've had, just had this big dinner with a bunch of customers. I'm tired. Got a big meeting tomorrow morning. Big, big, big. And... Um, <laughs> I hear uh, this voicemail is from, like, you know, a second cousin. My mother's cousin is who it was. And she's like, Terry, this is Mary Beth. Um, I just wanted to call you. I need to reach you. Your mother's had a massive stroke. Um, and she's at St. Joseph's um, Hospital in, in St. Charles. Will you call me back? Okay. Well, who do you think I called first? My sponsor. So I get on the phone. I'm like, oh, my God, Helen, my mother, my mother's had a massive stroke. And so um, we talked about it. We prayed. And um, I did call the second cousin back, and I got the facts, right, blah, blah, blah. She had been um, had the stroke probably for two days before she was found. Um, so I decided I wasn't going to – it's a four-hour drive, right? So I decided I'm not going to leave at 1130 because the program has taught me to take care of myself today. I knew I would not be any good to anybody, nor did I even know if I was going to go. So let, let me tell you that. I'll be real honest. I did not know if I was even going to go. So Helen and I, my sponsor, decided I'm going to sleep on it. I'm going to sleep, and I'm going to call her first thing in the morning and decide what I'm going to do. So I was able to sleep. By the love of a higher power, I was able to get some rest that night and wasn't obsessing about what I was going to do. So I got up in the morning, and I called Helen straight away, and we talked. And um, she said, well, what do you think? And I said, you know, I think I need to go. I do think I need to go. And she said, okay. So I called um, this guy who works for me in Kansas City. I told him what happened. Of course, when people don't know your story, right, they're like, oh, my God, her mother's had a massive stroke, you know. Terry, we know you're so close with your mother. Oh, my God. You're like, you don't even know. You have no clue. This woman's not talked to me here. So anyway, so... um. So I take off driving to to um, St. Louis. Now, honestly, in my brain, I thought it was a two-hour drive because from Columbia to Kansas City and Columbia to St. Louis is two hours. So I'm thinking two-hour drive, I'll be there. All of a sudden, I figured out it's four hours. What the hell? I'm going to drive for four hours. 
but it was a blessing, right? My higher power takes situations and helps me, helps me. Because that whole four-hour drive, I talked to my sponsor. I talked to the women I sponsored. I talked to my two closest friends. I got so filled up on that drive-in, right? I was like overflowing and got there. Now, my family, so my grandmother, is my mother's mother is living. Um, she's 95 now, so that was two years ago. She would have been this cute little 93-year-old there. Um, both of her nieces, my, my, uh, both my grandmother's nieces are there. And uh, everybody's so glad that I came, right? Terry, we're so glad you're here. Well, here's the deal. When, when a person doesn't have a, a living will, when they don't have, you know, who the hell knows what? going to happen? What do you do? She's at a Catholic hospital. Um, I had no rights to make any decision for her health care at that time. Um, luckily for me, my uh, dad's brother lives in that city and is a retired lawyer, so that helped. I called him, and he started the proceeding that needed to happen for me to, to take action. Well, um, I just got in the wheelbarrow, guys, and just did it, right? I just did it. I cannot tell you that I had love for her. I, I, and, and Helen and I talked about this a lot. It wasn't a feeling of a she gushy love, right? Like I have for my kids and my husband. It's not like that. It was an overwhelming sense of compassion. It was this program leading me one day at a time to this spot in time to be able to say, this is a, a child of God. She's a child of God, like me, like you, like everyone else, right? Um, I had the ability to suit up and show up. I had the, um, the, you know, a business mind, right? So I can make decisions very well. I'm very good at that kind of task-oriented stuff. Give me a list. I can work through it. Um, it is today one of my gifts, and I realized that. For years I thought, I have no gifts, right? I can't sing, I can't dance, I, you know, I can't play a musical instrument. I, I, just, I have no gifts, right? And over time I've had to learn is um, I do have many, many gifts. Um, they're just not those ones that I always wanted, right? It's like accepting your gifts right where you are and what, they, what God has given you, what you're doing for that. But anyway, through that um, period of time, right, I... Um, her friends are coming in, and they're just like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, everybody's looking at me pretty much like I have three eyes and, uh, you know, uh, very cold. It was a very uncomfortable situation. But for me, I had my higher power with me the whole time. I prayed for my mom. I sent out prayer requests. Lee and I are in the same um, kind of international prayer chain, so I had sent out prayer requests, and I did those things that I knew I had to do. Well, what ended up happening is I'm a double-decker now in the sandwich generation. And I'll tell you that because I have to take care of my grandmother as well. My grandmother's 95 now, sweet Thelma. Um, Thelma actually got to Al-Anon um, many years ago in her early 80s. She got there uh, and uh, because I just kept, you know, I wouldn't engage with her on the phone or in person when she wanted to talk about my mom. I'd say, Grandma, I'm called to talk to you. Right, we're going to talk about you, and we're going to talk about me and my family, right, and you and Grandpa or whatever. And she struggled with that for a number of years, but finally she went to Alan. And it's so cute because I recently, um, and I'll tell you about this. I found her ODAT book. You know, it's underlined, and her little cute handwriting is in there. And um, she has uh, she's lost her eyesight now, but she would say how she would go to her Alan meetings and she would be the reader. They would let her read because she was very good at reading at the time and. So, um, you know, in that sense, you know, my grandmother got some peace about the disease of alcoholism. And, and um, recently I had to uh, <laughs> move my grandmother to assisted living. So when I tell you a double-decker, I am. I got um, my mom is in a nursing home in St. Charles. I have her in a long-term care facility. In fact, I just saw her last weekend. Um, I took her shopping. Uh, to Coles, and we got some some new things. She cannot, uh, you can't understand a word she's saying. Um, she does talk, but you know, you get hi, honey, uh, or things like that. But you don't. There's no. You can't have a conversation, is what I'm saying, right? Her right arm is totally frozen, as is her right leg. Uh, but I'm able today to um, care for her, and you know, through that process with my mom. Um, 
You know, forgiveness is a gift we give ourselves. I, I figured that out. It, it is definitely, it wasn't like, I didn't, I've never in my recovery had a burning bush scenario ever. My recovery has come like a race, you know, like a marathon, like a, I just keep going. And then you turn around and the gift is there. It's just right there. God's grace. Thank you, God, um, for these things because um, I've been able to, um, in, in my mom knows that I have forgiven her, right? Um, and I know that um, she loves me. She loves me the best way that she can today. Now, it's not been easy, trust me, after I moved her into this nursing home. Um, I would come up and, you know, check on her and visit. There's a lot you have to do. Um, she had no money, so I had to apply for Medicaid for her. Woo, that was a process. Got through that. Um, but she's angry, right? Well, who wouldn't be? I'd be angry, too, locked in my body and these kinds of things. And just before this last time that I saw her, the last two times, um, you know, it was not good, not good visits. She screams and yells and cusses at me and just is meaner than a snake. But the reality is I know that that has absolutely nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing to do with me. Um, and what a blessing to know that today, to have the recovery to get through that, to know that, right? Now, I will be very honest, this last time, um, I had told my sponsor and told one of my aunts, I said, listen, if she starts this stuff again, I'm just going to get an earlier flight home because I can't, I cannot do it this time. Um, you know, I know today what I can do and what I can't do. But anyway, let me tell you about this sweet little grandma I got. This sweet little grandma, um, was living in Springfield, Illinois. So two hours north of St. Louis is uh, little Thelma. And, uh, so I've had to start, you know, had to start engaging with her to help her out. And, uh, gosh, what a blessing that this situation has happened to allow me to have this relationship with her today. She is just a, the sweetest, sweetest person. We laugh our asses off on the phone. She is so damn funny and got such a, such a sense of humor. But, um, a, early August, uh, she called me three times on a Monday. And um, that's very odd, right? And um, I told my, my assistant at work, I said, listen, um, Thelma's called three times today. I said, I'm getting concerned. I may have to fly up there. So she was kind of looking at my counter. Tuesday came, four phone calls. And by the fourth phone call, I said, that's it. You know, we're going, I'm coming. So we cleared my calendar. You know, my thank God for my husband and his willingness to be able to say, that's fine. You know, I'll do what I need to do at home for the other, for the kids. So I flew up there and... Um, yeah, she couldn't see a thing. Blind as a bat. Had been hiding it from everybody and lived alone. And this, thank God for my grandfather. He's been gone since 1981. But um, he had bought them into one of these retirement communities where you live in the duplex and you can go to the assisted living and on and on. Thank you. Thank you, God, for that. So um, I thought I was going to have to make her go, right? She got there on her own, and we, you know, saw the unit. God has a way of working things out. There was a unit, a large unit. Of course, it has to be a large unit. can't be a small unit. Large unit, two doors down from one of her best friends. It just become available. Normally, they have a waiting list of 10 people deep, but they had already called all those people. No one needed it right then. Did we want it? Amen, right? Yes, of course we want it. So that was on a Wednesday afternoon on Thursday I got all the furniture I mean listen I can run a project all the furniture's moved da, da, da. by Thursday she's like it's happening I'm like you you right come on tell me it's happening so um she spent Thursday night over there and it looked like she had lived there I mean I'm telling you as an al I can get it done right you give me a job I can get it done right or I'm a I'm a taskmaster so um, her place looked like she had lived there for months. Cute, all her favorite little knicky knacks and, you know, all that. And uh, she's she's so funny. She's like, take some pictures of me. Take some pictures. Of, not that she can see them. You know, she's smiling and I'm taking the pictures, you know. Um, and, you know, we, we're able to, uh, you know, love on each other, right? Love on each other. And uh, she's so funny. She... Uh, I tell, she has this favorite restaurant in Springfield. Uh, I'll, I'll think of the name of it. I'm, I've been there like a dozen times in the last month. But um, so I took her there at the Chesapeake House. 
the Chesapeake House. So we went to the Chesapeake House, and, you know, here I am cutting my grandmother's food, right, making sure that her cod is all cut up so she can eat it. I'm getting an extra bowl of hush puppies for her because she loves hush puppies. And I'm in the moment, right? I'm not worrying about what's going to happen later, what's going to happen tomorrow, or what's happening at work, or, my God, what's happening at home. I am in the moment, the precious, precious moment. And thank you, God, that I can do that today. I mean, it is my loving higher power who has taught me how to do that. And that I can walk today um, as a woman of dignity and grace. I did not know how to do that when I got here. I was angry. I didn't smile. I didn't laugh. I wore navy blue, black, and beige. I blended in to the background. Uh, I had to learn how to date myself. I don't know if any of y'all have had that assignment, but I definitely had to learn how to date myself. My sponsor said, you got to figure out what your favorite food is, what your favorite color is, what, what do you like to do? Um, and I still joke about that. If something, you know, if there's something new that I want to try, I'll say, I'm going to date myself and go try whatever. So um, I, I had to do all those things because I didn't know who Terry was. You know, I had to find her in there. You know, she she had been lost for a long time. And um, getting to know myself, what an adventure, right? You're always going to have yourself, so you better figure it out. Uh, I mean, seriously, right? Your your parents are going to leave you. Your husbands, your partners are going to leave you. Your kids are going to leave you. Your friends are not going to be around forever. But you are who you are. You're stuck with yourself. I mean, we have this thing in our sponsorship family of we put them on our mirror. It's called you're looking at the problem, you know? <laughs> Um, you are looking, and then my granny sponsor is, is pretty famous for saying, last hog in the pen, hog you it. I used to think that was the stupidest damn thing I'd ever heard, but um, I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, I've got to do those things. Now, turning my will and my life over to a care of a higher power was hard for me to do, but, you know, my sponsor taught me that I needed to start with the little things, right? And you all have done this parking spot, some little funky thing you need to store, I don't know, whatever it is, but I, re- I remember a time in, um, it was, you know, well into my recovery, my uh, my husband, my current husband's mom is a minister, he comes from a whole line of ministers, but she lives in Minneapolis, and we were there for Thanksgiving, And guess where we went the day after Thanksgiving? The Mall of America. Now, that's insanity in itself, but we went to the Mall of America. You know, ooh, let's go to the Mall of America. Day after Thanksgiving. And so we're driving to the Mall of America, and uh, my husband and I, he's in the back seat. He goes, did you pray for a parking space? And I said, (laughs) as a matter of fact, I did. And lo and behold, we cracked up laughing because we turned the corner. The very first spot right outside one of the major department stores is open. I said, look, Carol, I said, there's a parking spot just for us. And she laughs and she says, Terry, God has bigger things to do than worry about your parking spaces. Now, she does not have this program, doesn't need this program, but I know that my higher power has a wonderful sense of humor, wonderful sense of humor, right? And um, does those magical things for me um, to remind me that, that God is in my life. I'm a penny person. You know, when I see a penny, I know that penny is for me. When I see it on the ground, um, there have been times when I've been desperate um, and, and pleading for God's help, and I'll turn and there'll be a penny, right? And I know I'm okay. Um, I am carried in the arms of my higher power, and for that, I am very grateful for that. So um, here I am with sweet Thelma. We got Thelma. Now she is uh, in, in assisted living. Uh, last weekend, I went back to Springfield to finish cleaning out her duplex. I can work from 5.30 to 11 on coffee and a little food and get it get it done, you know. Um, my sister came up. I'll tell you a little bit about my sister. She um, um, got sober December of 2010. I think it's the 16th. I better get that right in my calendar, but just recently. Um, she and I have not had a great relationship over the years. There's been a lot of... Um, resentment, right, that I wasn't the mother she needed me to be. On my side of that fence, I know that an 11-year-old can't be a mother. Can't. There's just no way. So I did the best that I could. But we have, um, we're building, we're working on that relationship, right? So we were together because um, she came up, she lives in Texas, uh, to help clean out my grandmother's things. And she was going to take some furniture with her that she needed. And I had um, some 
some Alabama relatives came up because they needed some things too. And, you know, I had to distribute all this stuff. And the, the good thing about it is my grandmother's alive, so she can say, well, I want Quincy to have the sewing machine, and I want, you know, Wanda to have this and you to have that. And, you know, um, I'm able to not get get uptight about any of this. It, and what's funny, I was talking to my dad. He goes, I don't know how you're doing it, right? He goes, aren't you ready to snap? And I said, not at all. It has been a privilege to do this, a privilege. And um, because I've gotten the ability to be able to use, you know, my gifts and to be loving and kind and compassionate and be that woman of grace and dignity with my grandma and be a good example and to help her do what she needs to do. So now she's happy in her assisted living place, and I call at least once or twice a day to check on her. Um, and, you know, I get, well, you need to call the doctor about this and, you know, these kinds of things. And I, and I do those things today because I won't be able to do those things much longer, right? She's 95. Um, we're having a good ride. Um, but my sister, so my sweet sister um, came up. My, We were... When we were going through the the things at my grandmother's, you know, we had these little sparks, these little moments that would happen, and she would say, you know, it's not fair that you didn't get the the alcoholic genes, right? The genetic genes, right? You didn't get the mental health genes. You didn't, all these things. I got the brown eye genes. I got, you know, the the bad acne genes, you know. I don't know why, right? It, it is what it is, Um and we we're, we've been able to talk through that, and I've been able just to be as loving as I can be. Um, I don't, you know, there's no answer for that. We we're in recovery. I'm in recovery. She's in recovery today. Um, that's where we need to be. Golly. Um, so this is my life uh, today. Through the care of a loving God and a higher power that's been there for me one step at a time, right? Through sponsorships, through going through a ton of meetings, to listening to people, to being available, right? To my sponsees, to knowing where I, I um, stop and you start. To knowing the difference, right? For not taking over your life um, and not, not taking over everyone's, right? To make all those decisions and to be in control, I always thought I had to be in control to make those things happen. Um, today, I, I really, truly know that um, I am a child of a loving higher power who wanted me here, right? Um, we had dinner the other night at the Chesapeake South with my grandmother, my sister and I, and um, it was as cute as it could be. Uh, my grandmother, she'd not had a glass of wine in years, and she asked for a glass of Chablis. So, um, I, you know, I'm like, okay, I don't know what he brought her, but he brought her something. So she had this half a glass of wine, and we were talking, and, you know, she said, you know, the only thing that's missing here is your mom, right? And uh, it, it's that fantasy of how we'd like it to be instead of the reality for how it is, right, how it is today. Um, so truly, um, you know, this is, I wrote this down this morning, cling to the thought that in God's hands, the dark past is your greatest possession you have and the key to life and happiness for others. With it, you can avert death and misery for them. So um, I know I've averted death and misery. I have lots of misery, but no death for me at this point. But in recovery um, and doing the things that we do every day, one day at a time, I've been able to, to work through that and be here today to be um, you know, as happy and joyous and free as I am capable of being um, and continue to work down, walk down this road. So anyway, I'm going to close with this. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.